Welcome back to our talk tonight. This is part two, and we're going to be looking at verses 129 to 136, as I said. And the section they fall under, the Hebrew letter that heads up this section, is pay. Normally spelt P-E if you put it in English, but it's pronounced pay. Or at least that's my best pronunciation anyway. So that's the section they fall under. Now, I am very wary, as you'd expect, of trying to find a hidden meaning in texts, looking at numerical values and trying to see some kind of esoteric hiddenness within things. That's more to do with Jewish Kabbalah or Christian Kabbalah, because there are Christian forms as well. It's kind of a mysticism, really, and we don't go there as evangelicals, not at all. Kabbalah really you could say is into the oneness of all things so really it's Babylonian and that would fit very much with my morning talks you could say. But I've had a look at this psalm and I've had a look at the letters that go across and I have found on occasions there is sort of a meaning to the letter and you know I think it's worth perhaps mentioning this right here right now. The Hebrew letter pay has been understood to mean mouth and by extension then because of what the mouth does it's about the word expression speech and breath and I wouldn't be including this tonight if I didn't think there was some value in it because as I said I don't want to go to anywhere that's sort of a bit dodgy really and I don't think to mention what I am tonight is but I just want to reassure you with that so what does what does this mean well if pay means mouth word expression what does our main verse tonight read? Verse 131 reads, I open my mouth and pant longing for your commands. I thought it was an interesting little link. I open my mouth and pant longing for your commands. So with his mouth, the writer draws breath and pants longing for God's words, commands which of course are spoken with God's mouth. So more literally, this verse means really, the writer opened his mouth as wide as it could go and he gaped, gaped it open in his desperation for God's truth and his word. I think that's a powerful image that he is gaping wide his mouth, panting, with his breath, in his longing for truth. And you could figuratively say, he's earnest in his desire to devour these truths, to swallow them up, to make them part of his self. I don't know if you'd agree with this, although I'd have a sneaking suspicion you might. Bible reading can often feel like a chore. It's something we're meant to do, so we kind of do it. People feel kind of duty bound, I guess you could say. But you know what I think is we need God to do a work in us so that the duty we sometimes feel is replaced by desire. And sometimes when we perhaps begin our Bible readings, the best thing we could do is to ask God to give us a real desire rather than something of duty. Maybe we should be asking the Lord that it help us to get to a place where our mouths are gaping open in our desperation for his truth and his word. Because when the desire is there, I think everything else follows. I wonder, can you feel the intensity of this writer and where he's at and the imagery he's given? I wonder if you can sense that sort of desperation that he has, maybe a bit like someone desperate for food, he's desperate for God's word. The other day I talked about deep roots and that there oh, it's come up again, but I remember at the time I was talking about God's word and how important that was and how linked into deep roots that actually is. And I was talking about Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. So I think it's important that 
we say, Lord, give us a panting, yearning, longing desire for your word. Because here's a good question. Do we pant for it? Are we desperate for it? Are we gaping wide within ourselves, eager for his truth? I think it's important to be in love with God and in love with his scriptures in that you know, proper sense of the meaning. I think if that can be something that is stirred within us, it will make a real difference in everything else we do. It seems to me that as we make God's word increasingly part of our lives, where we let truth truly affect us deep down inside, a number of things will happen. The first one is this, God unfolds his word, verse 130. He unfolds his word and we then have understanding. We understand, perhaps what we need to know in a given situation, but we certainly begin to understand the greatness of God and indeed his son, Jesus Christ. His words, as they're unfolded, give light. Metaphorically, they make luminous the very things we need to know because of God and his goodness. I think that's a really important thing. What a wonderful verse, verse 130. The idea of light, as it were, metaphorically being released so that we have that understanding. When we make God's word at the centre of our lives, it means we're making God at the centre of our lives. And as we make God at the centre of his li our lives, we're making his truth at the centre of our lives. These things fit together like hand in glove, really. And they're so, so important. And therefore, it really answers the, the central tenet of this psalm about God's truth and his word being absolutely at the centre of everything and in anything and everything that we are and we do. God's truth is wonderful. His statutes are wonderful, verse 129. The word wonderful is linked to other words, not surprisingly, of course, which mean astonishingly marvellous, even miraculous. I think you'd agree. God's word through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is indeed a miraculous thing. So when a love for God overwhelms us and we have a, a love uh, overwhelms us with regard to his word then we find this increasing desire within so rather than it being about a duty it becomes to more to do with our desire and that's a precious place to be at and to be involved in within ourselves as human beings true love for God and his word but here's something else that happens and it's this I don't know how popular this might be in certain modern churches, you could say, these days. But when we encounter God in his word, it won't be long before we see his holiness and his sinlessness. And I think that's an important thing. So we find ourselves as a people, often before the Lord, saying, I need mercy. Verse 132. The psalmist did that can't trust God's truth in his word without at the same time recognising we need mercy and grace. We suddenly recognise when we are getting closer to God that we could easily go astray, that sin might rule us, verse 133, and so our cry is that sin will not have its way in us. I don't know about you, but that's often been the case with me. So often, I'm crying out, Lord, don't let sin win in this situation. Let yourself, your truth, who you are, be the one in victory in this moment, whatever that moment might be. Indeed, the psalmist talks about footsteps. And really, you know, we, we want to be walking in God's footsteps, never stepping outside where his shoe is, so to speak, to be have a, a path fixed and directed by God, not going anywhere else but where he wants us to go. That our desire for him, for what is right, will be one for obedience. And really, that's what this, this talk is called. You know, it's about Psalm 119. It's about longing for God's word and obedience. 
And I think when we also give ourselves over to the Lord and we keep with him and walk with him, we will often find something happening. Streams of tears will flow in our lives. Uh, that might sound awfully negative, but I'll qualify what I mean in a moment. Streams of tears will flow in our lives, or at least the emotions will well up within. Why? Because we will see around us God's law not being obeyed. Verse 136. And I don't know about you, I've had righteous sorrow and righteous anger in my life over injustices. How I see things to be. Through the lens of God's scripture, I, I, I often find myself emotionally overwhelmed. And there have been times when there's been tears rolling down my face because of what I see and what, I've, what I see going on. And I'm, I'm yearning that people will turn to the living God. It seems to me if we truly are Christians and we're truth based, we will have a desire within for others to also be truth based and to become Christians as well. Rivers of water run down my eyes. That could be the literal translation here in this passage for this psalmist. And what we need is the heart transformed within. A heart transformed so that together we long for God's word and we long for obedience. In closing then, just a few thoughts really. I don't know, you know, when you hear words like decrees, law, ordinances, precepts and the like. I don't know when you hear those, whether you think like I do, my most immediate understanding or at least image is one of a judge, probably wearing those big wigs, and a jury. And you know, when you think in those terms, it can easily colour what the Old Testament means by law. It's easy to impose that, if you like, on the text. And I know I've done that. But the word law in the Old Testament is Torah in Hebrew. We've all heard the word Torah before. But the word law really means God is pointing out the way we should live. He's giving instruction about what is the best way to live and to be. And for me, when I think of Torah, God's law, his precepts, his ordinances, in that vein, it kind of gives me a different sort of feel on the text, really. If I can see that this text is to point me in a direction that is best, then that changes everything. And it's a really important thing, I think, to think about. I guess, in a way, what God's saying is, here's my truth. I don't want you making up your own because you'll muck it up. But I know what is good truth and what is the right truth. Here it is. I know what's best. A little while ago, I was talking to my daughter, Emily, and we were talking about, you know, the Bible being a set of rules, which is often what people say about it. And I remember saying, and I don't know if this is quite the right thing or the right way of looking at things, but I remember saying to her, Emily, I don't think it's a set of rules. I think it's a set of rescues. And what I mean by that is, is what God's laid down in his Torah, in his law, are rescues to rescue me out from something I could get myself into. Almost in advance, it's Simon, look, I'm pointing out, my instruction is pointing out to you that this is not the best way to be. Don't go with that. I'm rescuing you out by telling you in advance it's not what I want for your life. And maybe, I don't know, that helps us, helps me, I think, in a way, that this is what God's saying. He gives us his truth out of a place of concern, care and love. Where God's truth is, so is his light, verse 135. And, you know, when we think about, like, rules... They don't seem very light-like, but actually they are. They're full of light because they're beautiful things that God has given us and wants for our lives. In closing, I was thinking of Jesus. Jesus is the word, John 1 verses 1 to 3. He is the word. 
So he fulfills all that we see in this psalm and everywhere else, of course, in the Old Testament. He fulfills it all. He fulfills all eight of those special words the psalmist has used in this passage. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is also the light of the world, John 8 verse 12. So he is also linked with light as he is with truth. And number eight is the number of resurrection, of course. So may it be then, we might even know God's face shining on us as well. After all, in Jesus, we see the face of God and I've got the verses for that in the notes. I finish with this. We need, I think, to pant for God's word, for his truth, to long for it, to gape with our mouths for it, so to speak, and live by his truth. Not from a place of duty, but a place of desire. So it touches the head, the heart and the hands and we live a different life in this world because of it. We need God's truth to be a living truth rather than just something that just is something we remember in the brain, as it were. Oh, that we might have a passion for Jesus, the word, and we might indeed have a passion for God's word and words. So important that we do. May God bless you tonight. Thanks for sticking with me on quite a long talk, I know. Every blessing. Thank you. Thank you.